This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com coming to you from the the remote hinterlands of the Wabash River Valley Bottoms. The lower Wabash, unlike the upper Wabash, is likewise unto the lower Mississippi as compared to the upper Mississippi. Down here it's awful slow and sluggish. Does a lot of winding. The bottoms include a lot of sloughs, oxbow lakes, and swamps, and in the lower part even, the northernmost mangrove swamps in the United States. The mangrove swamps being common, or more common, especially from Cairo, Illinois, south. The Mississippi Delta beginning in deep southern Illinois And I can show you right where the Mississippi Delta begins. There's an outcrop of rock and a little creek bed, not many miles from the Ohio River. And everything north of that outcrop is not Delta. And everything south of that outcrop exposed there in that little creek, cleaned in New Orleans and the Birdsfoot Delta is Mississippi Delta mud. And to bring out a fact I had mentioned before, Since the white man has discovered the Mississippi Delta, it has extended almost 40 more miles. 40 more miles. The mouth of the Mississippi has extended the Delta 40 more miles since Europeans first discovered, well, not quite 10 miles every 100 years, maybe 6 to 8 miles every 100 years. Well, it doesn't take much arithmetic to calculate how long it's been since the Caribbean reached clean to Cairo, Illinois. Well, if the Mississippi River extended its delta straight south from Cairo, Illinois, at the rate of six to eight miles every hundred years, it would take between six and eight thousand years, again, depending upon how many miles per hundred years. That's not very long. A lot of other factors could be taken into consideration. I'm not taking into consideration catastrophic events, of course. Things do continue as they were from the beginning of creation, but as Peter the Apostle tells us, even though uniformitarianism, as Lydell, things in geology continue to progress steadily, but even in all that progression, one must take into consideration and will make horrible errors if he does not. The probability of catastrophism. Catastrophes of cataclysmic proportions do occur. We know, for instance, that about the year 1811, the greatest earthquake to ever occur in our knowledge upon the North American continent, yes, far greater than anything that happened at the San Andreas Fault or has happened, including the earthquake of 1906, the greatest earthquake, the greatest movement of the crust of the earth, was a movement that occurred on the New Madrid Fault, extending from approximately Memphis, Tennessee, up to Cairo, and then on up into southern Illinois, up the Wabash River Valley, changing the course of the Mississippi River in at least a dozen places, altering forever the landscape down there. Even the accounts of Colonel Davy Crockett tell of his bear hunts by his own testimony and bears hiding in the gigantic crevices in the earth and in the limestone, down in the cane breaks north of Memphis, Tennessee, and south of Cairo, Illinois, chasing bears into those crevices, big enough to walk in, of course now filled with Mississippi mud and hidden. Well, that all says much for the young age of the surface of our planet called Earth, and the record revealed in that geologic layer of our planet, and also the distance being only about 550 to 560 miles from Cairo to New Orleans. And by the way, that's from Cairo to sea level. Cairo being less than 500 feet above sea level, or about a little more maybe, give or take, all that area around there. That means that the drop of the Mississippi River from Cairo, 561 miles south to New Orleans, couldn't be much more than a foot per mile on average, and that explains the incredible sluggishness, the slow-movingness, the windingness of the Mississippi River. That's why in the old days they called it 
Old Man River didn't move too fast and wandered as it went. Well, let's get to Magna Carta, that slice of the laws of nature, the observations of men, of the way it is, what bobs forth from the nature of things. Some of these observations they have written down, and they've done so. Namely, most pronouncedly, a man by the name of Stephen Langton wrote them down. He penned Magna Carta, the year 1215 AD, 800 years ago this year. Stephen Langton, the man who gave us our chapter divisions in our Bibles, penned Magna Carta, the great charter, the big paper, to put it in plain American English. We come now to chapter 26. It has to do with the limitations on the power of government in collecting taxes. Remember, the greatest power that government has, even in our own country under a common law tradition, is the power to take a person's life, liberty, and property. But indeed, those are the only three things that any man has in this life here on earth, is life, liberty, and property. I like to say God gives man life so he can have freedom, liberty, or respecting his property, and the greatest piece of property he possesses is his life. Why do I say that? Because your property are your rights, your responsibilities. That's what a right is under the old understanding of that word, that Germanic word, Anglo word, right. It means responsibility, delegated duty, a stewardship of agency, a right, your right to free speech, your right to religion, your right to the press, your right to keep and bear arms, your right to self-defense, as we say, your right to remain silent. All of these are responsibilities. No, a right does not always have a corresponding responsibility. That is a perversion. A right is a responsibility. You can't separate a right from a responsibility. It's the same thing. But in our present world of humanism, where man becomes the measure of all things, the word right becomes hackneyed and means in men's minds something selfish, something that is mine, and it's mine because I want it. No, it's yours as a responsibility God-given, and you'll answer for your use of it, your stewardship of that jurisdiction, for example, as I said, over your tongue, over your right to self-defense, over the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, your right to remain silent, that other part of that right over your tongue. Those are responsibilities. So you have life, liberty, and property. And these, say our Constitution of the United States, Amendment 5, these shall not be taken without due process of law. What is due process of law? This phrase, due process of law, means the law of the land. And the law of the land means due process of law. That's why the phrase law of the land is included in our Constitution also. Article 6, lifted right out of Magna Carta. So you have life, liberty, and property. Yes, the law can take a man's life, his liberty or his property. And that really sums up Magna Carta. But no place is it more pronounced than it is here in chapter 26, a long chapter for Magna Carta. And I'm going to read it, although by reading it, it will seem confusion, many terms here and words that are now obsolete. But it does pay to read it, and I'm going to read it quickly, and then we're going to break her down. It says this, If anyone holding of us a lay fife, if anyone holding of us, that means of us, yes, the crown, us kings, shall die, our sheriff or bailiff, that means deputy. Remember, a bailiff is one having received a redelegation of authority from another who had received direct delegation from the lawgiver himself. A sheriff deputizes men, such as bailiffs in courtrooms and deputies, to extend and do his will. Well, if any one of us shall die, and our sheriff or bailiff shall exhibit our letters patent or summons for a debt which the deceased owed to us, owed to us, owed to the crown, we're talking friends, neighbors and relatives, we're talking about taxes here, it shall be, watch this, it shall be unlawful for our sheriff, whose sheriff? Well, unlike America, the sheriff belonged to the central government, the crown. These landholders are trying to limit the crown's power through the sheriff. If our sheriff or bailiff, it shall be unlawful for them if they attach and catalog, that means take inventory of, chattels, that means personal property, of the deceased. Maybe I said unlawful. I meant it shall be lawful for them to do that, to attach and inventory 
the personal property, here called chattels, movable property, not land, inventory it of the dead man, found upon the lay fife, that means upon the land, that's what a fife is, to the value of that debt at the sight of law-worthy men. Law-worthy men, that means men qualified to serve on a jury. The government, if they're going to attach somebody's property to pay a debt of taxes, must do so by first impaneling witnesses to watch everything they do. Neighbors, by the way. That's what this phrase, law-worthy men, means. Then it says, provided always that nothing whatever be thence removed until the debt which is evident shall be fully paid to us, to the crown, until the taxes are satisfied. And the residue, whatever is left over after you sell this fellow's property, shall be left to the executors to fulfill the will of the deceased. In other words, it goes to his family. No, the local sheriff doesn't get it. The crown doesn't get it, if indeed there is anything left over. And if he's paid his debt, that is, it says here, if nothing be due to the crown from him, taxes aren't a debt, but his obligations shall go to the deceased, saving to his wife and children that are reasonable shares. Well, the primary object of this chapter 26 is to provide due process, a procedure that the government must follow when a fellow dies in trying to get its tax obligations from the deceased man's estate so that the government won't take more than they are obliged to take than that which is owed. Is this applicable today? You bet it is. The government of the United States don't know about state governments as much. I'm sure there's abuses there. Well, I know there is. I've seen them happen. In some states, not all, but I know that governments habitually, when taxes are owed, take one, two, three, four times the amount of property in value needed to pay taxes, sell it, and take all the money. Well, it happens all the time. I've seen banks do it, been involved in cases where banks talk the courts into going along with them in cases of forfeiture, get their hands on a man's entire estate at his weakest emotional point, maybe when his wife or children have gotten in a horrible accident, or he has been, tell him they will take care of his estate, pay off his debts to the bank, get him to turn everything over to them, and then skin him of the entire amount, two, three, four, five times more than the debt owed, and work the law to do it and get the courts to agree with them. All without due process, that is what is happening here. So again, we see that Magna Carta is in force by its first principles. At every point, the first principles of the laws of nature never change. The applications become different to different people in different circumstances through the centuries as the centuries roll on. But these first principles do not change Indeed, yet today, just as this chapter 26 demands, if the government's going to take your property, the law says they must follow the process that is due. And that's what chapter 26 provides, is a definite, pre-designed process the government must follow to provide a check upon the abuses of people's property. You know, when a fellow died back then, as often today, there are debts left because maybe he didn't expect to die. Or maybe his debts had not yet become due. Well, once he has become deceased, those debts are due. But the crown, the government, the central government in the country of England, when that happened, comes storming in to a man's land, attached every movable piece of property they could find on the land, from cattle to hogs, horses, farm implements, plows, gangs, harnesses, furniture, gold, silver, whatever they could find, and sold it at a sheriff's sale. And the crown wanted to support the sheriff, so the sheriff would do the crown's bidding. So the central government said, take what he owes us, give it to us, Mr. Sheriff, and you can do whatever you want with the rest. And sheriffs, of course, often kept the whole caboodle. And although that was wrong, and although our common law said that was wrong and had for centuries, the procedures had been neglected that would stop that, the due process. So here, chapter 26 puts that in place. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. You can find my books at Amazon.com. Just type in my name, Brent Allen Winters, and they'll come up. 
In the meantime, stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. Coming to you from the hinterlands of the Wabash River Valley Bottoms, where the Mayflowers are thick in the spring. Now, that doesn't mean they come out in May, necessarily. That's the name of a flower. Most people would call it a weed. Grows in the river bottoms here, the Mayflower. Does come out early, doesn't last long. Then up comes the nettles, the nettles. Microscopic pricks. Millions of them on each plant. Get into your skin if you touch them or try to grab them. And eat you alive, blame near. Every one of them irritating. A little bit of poison on each one. Just a little, but you get a lot of them, and it makes a terrible rash and an awful itch and is uncomfortable to the point of keeping you from sleep. They grow thick in some places. You don't want to walk through those places. You'll get them on you. Got to know what you're doing. can be a terrible danger to a coon hunter walking through the bottoms at night or running through the bottoms following his dogs. Can't always see the nettles that clearly, and when you get into a patch of them, you're done. Well, we're talking about the laws of nature, aren't we? Yes. But sometimes men observe the laws of nature, talk about them. Other men write them down, their observations of the laws of nature, that first volume of God's revelation, of his will to men. You say his will? Yes, because his law is the way it is, and it's not going to change, and he made it that way. That means it's his will, and you aren't going to fight it. Well, Magna Carta is one of those writings of renown, the recordation of the observation of men, concerning the way things are. And if we do not follow the way things are, we'll suffer a horrible consequence. That's what Magna Carta is. 63 chapters. That means 63 headings. All of them very short. Chapter 26 is longer than most. One sentence it is in the Latin text. A long sentence, but one sentence. One sentence of 89 words. That's 8 nine or 89 And we had said the primary object of this chapter is to regulate the procedure to be followed in attaching the personal estates of men when they pass away, who happen to be also, at the time of their decease, owing taxes to the government in England called the Crown. And one of the abuses this chapter 26 attempts to remedy is that when sheriffs would come in and take the property of a person, deceased, property of their estates, to satisfy a tax obligation that had not been paid, the sheriff, just as today in our American counties, would hold a sheriff's sale. A kind of a fire sale, some people say, auction off the property of the deceased taxpayer. Well, the government, the central government in England, the Crown, had said to these sheriffs, we don't care how much money you keep beyond what the tax obligation is, but you send us our due and we'll let you keep as much as you want. You can fleece and skin the families of this deceased man every which way but Sunday. And the central government, the Crown, said, we'll back you up on that. Don't worry about it. Well, this is the same system that occurred. We see it in the Newer Testament of the Bible. Rome had instituted such a system. The writer of the first gospel was a turncoat Israelite that joined the evil empire. His name was Matthew. And he, by purchase, that's the way you became a tax collector in the Roman Empire. You bought the privilege, and along with that purchase came the right to take everything you wanted. Keep much for your own self. We have another example, a man in the Newer Testament, a man who climbed up in a sycamore tree, as we used to sing as children. For the Lord he wanted to see, he was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. His name was Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector, a nasty man. He, with the backing of the power of the Roman legions, took everything he wanted from people, gave the Roman government what they said they wanted, and he kept the rest, and they didn't care how much he took. He could take an entire estate, leave wife and children starving, much as tax collectors do today. I've seen men commit suicide over such things. Families turned out into the streets who, before the tax man arrived, had nice homes. No, they weren't tax cheats, by the way. In effect, robbing some men of their lives, throwing some in jail. Others just take all their property and destroy their families. The problems which Magna Carta address, problems such as this, the tax collector performing a sheriff's sale, and the sheriff keeping 
the entire intake of the sale except what he sent to the central government called the Crown not many years ago. Well, it's been 20 now, I suppose. There was a county, I'll not name the county, close by to home. I was running for Congress, and there were 27 counties in our congressional district. It was rather sprawling, comparatively thinly populated. As a matter of fact, it was the largest congressional district, geographically speaking, in square miles, the largest one east of the Mississippi River. One of these 27 counties, for the last 90 years, had been saying we only let Democrats in the courthouse for two reasons. Number one, to pay their land taxes. We'll let them come in to do that. And number two, we'll let them come in the courthouse when they're criminally prosecuted to stand trial. That includes also they may enter the courthouse to be thrown in jail. What I mean to say by that is this county was entirely controlled by the Republican Party and had been well over a hundred years, if not for a hundred and thirty years. But for at least the last ninety years of that time, when a sheriff held a sheriff's sale, the sheriff took in all the money, paid the debts that the creditors to the estate had proven, and then pocketed the rest in his personal account. As far back as it could be traced, that had been done for the past ninety years at that time. It had been done so long that the practice was never questioned indeed. It had achieved the status. The sheriff simply didn't turn over the residue, the remainder, what was left over after the creditors had been paid. He didn't turn it over to the family. And sheriffs, during many of those latter decades of that 90 years, I think really believed that they were doing what the law allowed. Because, as I had said, it was custom, well established. But at that time, this practice came to light. And for the first time since the war between the North and the South, because of this custom of sheriffs, of pocketing money at sheriff sales, for the first time since the war between the North and the South, a Democrat won the race for the sheriff's office. And hasten to add, things didn't get any better. They got a little worse, if that can be possible. I guess it was, because it did get worse. Well, this chapter 26 of Magna Carta was directed to precisely such an abuse. By setting forth a procedure, a common law, a due process procedure that puts safeguards to check such abuses of sheriffs. And following this, chapter 26 demanded that the sheriff could not touch a single chattel of a deceased landholder unless he came armed with a legal warrant. A legal warrant. Watch this. A legal warrant that vouched the existence of the amount owed to the crown. The sheriff couldn't just blow in, grab everything, sell it, and keep the money. No, there were some lawful requirements that the courts would enforce. And watch this. Under this provision of Magna Carta, Chapter 26, the sheriff was only allowed to attach as many chattels of personal property as might reasonably be expected to satisfy the obligation due to the tax man. No, he couldn't just go in and attach everything and start selling things off. And number three, everything so taken, the sheriff having taken it to satisfy the tax obligation, everything taken, this provision required must be carefully inventoried. (laughs) And number four, not only must it be inventoried, it must be inventoried in the sight, I'm quoting, at the sight of lawful men, respectable, if humble neighbors specially summoned for that purpose. We're talking here about the impaneling of a jury to watch the government as they came in to attach a man's property, and they were required to ensure and watch him inventory every bit of it. And then fifth, these men impaneled as the jury to observe this inventory were to assist in valuing each article and to see to it that no more chattels were taken than could be necessary to cover the debt, to cover the tax obligation. And then chapter 9 of Magna Carta says that no land, the crown could seize no land to satisfy a tax obligation until all of the deceased taxpayer's personal property was exhausted. So number one, this chapter 26 requires that the sheriff cannot take anything belonging to a person to satisfy a tax obligation unless he come armed with a legal warrant vouching the existence and amount owed. Precisely. Number two, 
It allowed him also then to attach only as many of a man's personal property, his chattels, as might reasonably be expected to satisfy the debt due to the tax man. Three, everything taken must be carefully inventoried. Number four, in the sight of the jury, lawful men impaneled, respectable of humble neighbors, specially summoned for that purpose. And these neighbors, impaneled as the jury to observe the inventory, were to assist the sheriff in valuing each article, to see to it that no more personal property is taken than is necessary to cover the obligation. Is this applicable today? You bet it is. How often have I seen the tax man, the IRS man, take the money in a person's bank account without any, without due process? Without, that is, a legal warrant. Seize the bank account, of course. The banks are afraid of the IRS because they have the power to shut them down if they don't cooperate with the IRS. The IRS has total control and having more all the time. And how often have I seen the IRS attach all of a man's property, personal and real, the value of which would cover the tax obligation, even if there was one, often there isn't, but cover it three, four times over. Take it all, sell it, keep the money. Good luck getting it back. Oh, I know, I know, the court says a person has a remedy, can go into court. Oh, he might prevail, he might not. This third requirement here grabbed my attention. It says everything so taken must be carefully inventoried in the sight of this jury and panel to watch the sheriff do this. Applicable here now today because the IRS will bust in on a house without a warrant. Yes, I've seen it happen. I've been there when it happened. I was in an office building once when it happened, and they tried to raid my office just because it was in the same building. I told them it was a law office. They said they stayed out, but they didn't. It is for that reason I know some men that practice in the area of taxes and defend in criminal court men falsely accused. I've known such lawyers and law firms that have not just heavy locks on the doors made of steel to their offices and no windows but heavy steel doors and steel bars placed across the doors so that the IRS cannot bust in and compromise and steal without a warrant. The IRS now will break in, remove everyone from a certain room or a certain place, and there begin seizing property and putting it in boxes and hauling it off, not allowing anybody to see it. And then if anything is returned, it is not done so with inventory. Someone may say, well, I've seen them do it right. Or some IRS agent may say, I do it right. Well, you maybe you do, maybe you don't. But I know often it is not done because we're not paying attention to fundamental law such as this here in Magna Carta. Now, remember we said that Magna Carta, like our Constitution of the United States, established nothing new, but reached back to Anglo-Dane England before the Norman Conquest of the year 1066 and attempted to establish something old and forgotten from back at that time. That is precisely that which our Constitution of the United States also did, according to Justice James Wilson. It is not, he said, our Constitution is not an attempt to establish what the Normans put in England that was governing at that time, but it was an attempt to reach back before the Norman Conquest and establish in America the customs of the Anglo-Dane. And indeed it has. It did all it could here in chapter 26 to reserve for the wife and children of a deceased man the residue of his estate after his debts were paid, using the words reasonable shares of wife and children. Now these had persisted at old Celtic law in Scotland. The Anglos, the Saxons, the Danes, and the Celts, their law being strikingly alike, says Algernon Sidney, back in the late 1600s, strikingly alike, in generals as well as particulars. The Scots law retained this custom that Magna Carta attempts to reestablish because the Scots law guaranteed the widow's part, that means the widow of the deceased man, their baron's part, that word baron's an old Scottish word, a contraction of the English born ones, heirs of blood and body, children, offspring. So the widow's part, the baron's part, not leaving a man at liberty to dispose of all of his property at death by will, not leaving him at liberty to give it to someone else and leave his wife and children destitute. The law says, no, they must have the widow's part and the baron's part. And so it is today also in many American jurisdictions, many American states, most of them, in fact. The law doesn't allow a man to leave his wife and children destitute in his will. This is Brent, Alan Winters, 
www.commonlawyer.com. Please stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. This is Brent Allen Winters, CommonLawyer.com. That's www.commonlawyer.com. And we're back for the third and final segment of the hour talking about Magna Carta. Magna Carta in this, its 800th anniversary, signed this year, 800 years ago this year, that is, on the 15th of June, the year 1215. We're in chapter 26, establishes reasonable shares for a widow and children. No more of this business of the church coming in and persuading a guilt-ridden man to sign over his entire estate to the church. No, we find the record here that it is agreed upon by the landholders of England that no matter what a man may want to do with his property, the law says he cannot leave his widow and children bereft of something, some percentage, to keep them alive. The church had a way of demanding their share, and their share often amounted to the whole estate. And don't think they didn't play upon that gift that keeps on giving, called guilt, to get the job done. I once read an account written by the confessor, the Roman priest, who received the confession of the king of France. And this priest was writing to a friend, bragging about the power he had over this man, racked with old age pain, in fear of hell, and guilt, and guilt-ridden, the priest said that he received his confession, and he pumped out of him more and more evil, chided him for what he had done, and then he says, and I'm quoting, boxed hell about his ears, and said it would all be taken care of if he would do but one thing, that is, turn over the great part of his wealth to the church, and to put his army, the French army, under the command of the Roman Pope. Well, that's the kind of baloney that was going on here in England. Magna Carta is the record of the landholders of England, along with the crown, agreeing that that is not right, that in all events, a man may give away some of what he has, but he cannot leave his wife and children out of his will. Again, we see Magna Carta harking back to the old Anglo-Dane law. And I stress again that here in America, our Constitution and our whole common law tradition is an attempt to hark back not to what was then across the pond in England, a bastardized form of our common law, but to hark back to the Anglo-Danes and the Anglo-Saxons and the Celts, as Algernon Sidney points out, and establish our law accordingly. It is a fascinating point that the inheritance laws we have in America come from those Teutonic, Germanic, Nordic tribes, and that law, called the Volkreich, has always been sensitive to ensure that families and fathers that the wealth, or lack thereof, just the property, if it isn't much, stay in the family. We have a vestige of that in the law of Scotland yet today. A man's property is divided into three parts, the widow's part and the baron's part. The barons are the children of one's body, the born ones, an English contraction of those two words, and the widow's part. We see also what are called the community property laws in the United States, especially in those states settled by the Spaniards. Southwestern states, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, those states have what is called community property laws. Many people believe that those are from the Spaniards and part of the Roman system. They are not. And the reason for that is this, and how the Spaniards got that tradition is a fascinating story in the extreme. That tradition called the community property laws of marriage and family. The Goths and the Visigoths, about 250,000 of them got up in mass and left their home in what was then Sweden. Men, women, and children, they came south. Again, nobody knows exactly why, but they did. It was an impulse. They came south during the 5th century A.D. They came to the edge of the Roman Empire and requested permission to enter. The Roman emperor refused. The Visigoths, or rather these Goths, went to war with the Roman legions and decimated them, and killed the Roman emperor at the Battle of Andropopol. Proceeded on down into Rome, took the place over, stole everything that wasn't nailed down, ate everything that was available to eat, hung out for a few years, sacked the place, got bored, and left. And when they left, they went to Spain. And there, these Swedes, by the way, which were descended from a 
Anglo-Saxon by the name of Gietin, who had settled Sweden. These Swedes stayed in Spain and intermixed with the Spaniards, and the history of their law intermixing with the Spaniards' law is also a curious fascination. Good many lessons to be learned from it, but they did give to the Spaniards a part of their Volkreich, we call it today our common law, respecting the rights of widows and children in family law, called today in the United States community property laws, and these Spaniards that came to the New World carried that part of the common law of the ancient Swedes, descended from the ancient Anglos, carried that to the New World, and it persists in those states where the Spaniards first settled. Although the Spaniards otherwise were Romanized, had Roman law, as did the French, but the French have no community property laws because the Swedes didn't move into France after sacking Rome. Well, again, Magna Carta reaches back and attempts to reestablish something very old that had been lost. That is good. A theme of the Bible, the rights of widows and orphans, indeed. And a theme of Magna Carta. Magna Carta opens the first few chapters protecting the rights of widows and orphans. And the Bible says that the rights of widows and orphans are above all things. You better not offend one of them. God says he won't tolerate it. And the reason for that is this, because God's covenants... His covenants, yes. His fundamental duty given to mankind, given to our first father Adam, given to Noah later on, restated Abraham to be fruitful, multiply, fill the land, take dominion of it, conquer it, according to God's terms, in order to bring productivity out of it. No, not to destroy it, not to waste it, but to make it productive. Because the land is the Lord's, says the Bible, and the fullness, that is, the production thereof. These covenants connecting to land come to mankind through the man, the male of our species. And thus, wives fall under that umbrella, as do children, but where a woman is widowed, has neither husband nor father, and children are orphaned, having no father. God says, I'm their protector. You better not mess with them. Messing with them is messing with me, and I'll get you. And so it's good to keep in mind that we are to give special consideration to children. Orphans, that means fatherless, not motherless, fatherless. Orphans are fatherless. They may have a mother, but they don't have a father. Give special consideration to them and to widows who no longer have a husband or a father. Their husband has either perished or has become unavailable for some reason other than her own. Bottom line, if a dead man's last will and testament attempts to defeat any giving of property to his wife or children, his widow and orphans, the law steps in and provides for them and says, no, he can't do that. But then in those days, the church had come to claim what they called the dead man's part. The dead man's part. And the church says if a man's guilty enough and feels guilty and wants to keep his soul out of purgatory, he can pay money and do it. And that's obviously a lie, but that's what they said. And the bishops were saying, you leave money to the church and it'll save your soul from hell. Don't you ever believe that's true. It ain't. That's the ludicrousness of that crazy doctrine of old Tetzel that traveled about Europe, telling people that if they paid X amount of dollars, they could be forgiven of murder. If they, if they paid a little less, they could be forgiven of adultery. And on and on, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. Tetzel was saying, when the coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs, hogwash. Well, Magna Carta said no, and that is part of the reason why, a great reason why, when the Pope heard that King John had signed Magna Carta, he threw an absolute hissy fit. And those that were present and observed it recorded it. You can read about it. But he denounced Magna Carta, excommunicated all those involved in its sign, including Stephen Langton, its drafter, and all the landholders of England, threw them out of the church, said they were all going to hell, and he relegated them to hell, called excommunication. Let them be, as some say, anathema, irreversibly doomed to hell. Why? Well, like Rome's always been, he was interested in the money. He had the whole kingdom under his thumb at that point, and Magna Carta took it out from under his thumb. Well, thus is chapter 26 of Magna Carta. Brings us now to chapter 27 of the 63 chapters of this venerable document called Magna Carta, meaning the big paper. Chapter 27 says this. Listen to it. If any freeman shall die intestate, that means without a will, without having provided or otherwise said what he wants done with his property, 
It says his chattels, that means his personal belongings, not his land, but his personal belongings, his chattels, shall be distributed by the hands of his nearest kinfolk and friends under supervision of the church, saving to everyone the debts which the deceased owed to him. Now this is the great balance of Magna Carta. Magna Carta provides not only for widows and children, but says if a man die, those to whom he owed money should get what they can of the estate without cutting in to the provision of wives and children. The church didn't really matter. Magna Carta would just as soon cut the church out of that take entirely. The abuses had become so incredibly great. The church, doing the very thing Jesus Christ said the Pharisees were doing, devouring widows' houses, But then Magna Carta comes back and says, now wait a minute, a couple of things here. We're not going to take the church clear out of the mix. We'll allow them to be the supervisors. Why? Well, because the church courts, or the courts church, as they are called in England, or have been called, were the equity courts, the courts that handled family matters, adoptions, marriages, and trusts, matters of fiduciary duty. But Magna Carta said, we're not going to give it over all to the church and let the church do everything because what happens in such a case, the church does what it does in secrecy and steals the entire estate. Therefore, when a freeman shall die without a will, his property shall be distributed not by the church, not under the complete control of the church, but under the control of his nearest kinfolk and friends, whichever may be most available. The church may supervise, indeed, to see that it is not done wrongly, but... That supervision is under the eye of the law. And, friends, neighbors, and relatives, that is, most fundamentally, the way we do it today here in America. The executors of estates, friends, and neighbors, and relatives, whoever may be most available, starting with relatives, as Magna Carta says here, kinfolk, they do the distributing in America under the supervision, the watchful eye of the court, the court requiring that such distributor or executor of a man's estate submit the report to the court until all is put in order and put in the proper hands. But most importantly here, by implication, this chapter 27 of Magna Carta says to King John and the crown, the government, the central government, when it comes to a deceased man's estate, hands off. The central government can't come blowing in and just take it. No, there is a due process here required. Now, here in America, we see that the central government, the general government sitting in Washington, D.C., does just that. They blow in and just take a deceased man's estate. Yes, I've seen it. They take his bank account. They'll take his property. And if nobody says anything, they do it without any due process of law. Well, in those ancient days, I say the ancient days, 800 years ago this year, men, good, bad, rich, and poor were in horror of dying intestate. Scared to death of it, and for good reason. The priests of the church had inculcated in all men a belief that dying, a man had a duty to leave much of his estate to the church. Of course, they did that for obvious reasons. They wanted the money. But they had that ever-present club with which to beat dying men into submission called guilt. And these churchmen, these priests, would even withhold last rites. If a man didn't say he'd give up his property to the church, I think they call it extreme unction. It's a meaningless ritual. You say, well, it means something to some people. That doesn't mean it has any efficacy. It has none. It's contrary to the Bible. It means nothing according to the Bible, and therefore I say it means nothing. But men had been taught it did mean something, and therefore they believed it and were afraid. And these evil churchmen would say, well, I'm not going to give you extreme unction. Well, if he didn't give him extreme unction, he believed he'd go straight to hell. Sign over your estate, and then I'll do it. Otherwise, I won't, said the priest. How refreshing to be around men when they're passing from this life that don't have such superstition beat into their brains. I was with a man recently, well-known in my hometown. I was visiting a great-uncle up in his 90s. They had a birthday party for him at the nursing home. But as I was walking out, I noticed the name on the door of a man I knew. I didn't know was there. I went in and spoke with him. He was down. He couldn't get up. Well over 90, no teeth and a smile on his face. Well respected the man around there when I was growing up. And I said, can I pray with you? And he laughed out loud and said, you bet you can. And we did. He had no fear and no guilt because he knew that all of his sins had been forgiven, past, present, and future. This is Brent Allen Winters, commonlawyer.com. No priest could ever beat that fellow into believing their superstitions. 
and talking him and giving over everything he had to the detriment of his family. This is Brent Allen Winters, www.commonlawyer.com. Please join us again next time, at this same time, here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network.